so we, we're going to do a bunch of things today. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, how companies are organized. So as you go forward in your career, you will hopefully get a job and you will go to work for a company. Fantastic. And how do you picture that working out? Do you see sort of the company being organized around you? Because you've got great skills. Congratulations. Of course they'll be lucky to have you on board. The answer is no. Now, traditionally, back in the day, for example, when I started, there was an engineering department or some sort of technical department that you would join and you'd be part of that department. And the company works on stuff and they would have people, you know, work would come to that department and would be split up among the people in that department. You'd work on it, you'd get your part done and it would go back to somebody else and it would flow on. That's sort of the classic model. A lot of companies are still set up that way. You work in the engineering department, you work in the technical department, so be it. Okay? But what they've realized is that's sort of an inefficient way to do that. It, primarily communications is what it does. Because if you're working in the technical department, who do you talk to? People you work with, right? The other technical people who are potentially just working on other projects. So what happens is things get dropped. Things get missed. You know, inputs that come from customers or from other people in the company just doesn't make it to you. So a lot of companies have reorganized the way they do stuff. And now they're really sort of based on projects. So you, instead of being assigned to a technical department, instead you're going to be assigned to a particular project. Interesting thing about projects, projects don't last forever, right? And actually projects are relatively short-term things, right? You're responsible for version two of the product, or you're responsible for the new blue widget product, right? And you will work on that for a period of time. If you want to get even more fun, your boss might be associated with that project, right? So if you work on multiple projects during the year, guess what? You're going to have potentially multiple people that you report to, which isn't that big of a deal, assuming that you can get along with people, which is sort of important. But it becomes a much more interesting point at the end of the year when the company tries to evaluate your performance, right? There's not just one person they need to talk to. There's actually four or five people who have to do evaluations for, you know, potentially 30 or 40 people that they had worked for during the year. So things can get sort of funky sort of quickly on this. Arguably, our organizing on a project is a little bit better, okay? But not every firm does it. When you get dropped into a company, you'll probably be in one of these two different organizational structures. And it's entirely possible the company that you go to work for will change. They do flip back and forth. And it all depends who's running the show, right? Somebody who shows up and is very progressive says, hey, we're all going to organize based on projects. Poof, they'll do that. And if it doesn't work out, <laughs> they will go right back to the old method. So a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, my particular experience in this area is uh, actually, uh, I've worked for companies, what they, they don't do it necessarily on a project basis, but they do it on a vertical basis. So based on the market that the products are designed to serve, they organize the company. So for example, financial markets, retail markets, transportation markets, what they'll do is they'll take a whole bunch of people and say, congratulations, you're working on the financial vertical. And all those people work together. And it goes all the way through, you know, it's, a, it's accounting, it's finance, it's engineering, it's uh, network, it's whoever, right? They're all organized on that. What's interesting is that <laughs> the companies that I've worked at that, who organize that way, you know you just have to hang out for a while because it's going to change. Because what happens is they go vertical for a while, the market goes up, the market goes down, whatever. They get nervous and then they go back to sort of a hierarchical, you know, finance, engineering, network, what have you. Time goes on, gets new management, and they go once again, they go vertical. So they haven't quite worked out how they want to do this. In my opinion, going with a vertical organization for companies is actually a little bit better because it allows you to more closely focus on that vertical customer's needs. Not every customer is the same. If I'm running a Walmart, I have a different set of needs than if I'm running, for example, a telephone company or building cars or doing something like that. So a bunch of different ways to organize it. You will be plot dropped into this and you will do something, but um, whatever you do, you can probably have multiple experiences. All right. So that's just how companies are organized. Now we get to ask what you'll be doing when you work for those companies. Fundamentally, with a little luck, you'll be doing some design projects. So the question is, what is the goal of a technical design project? Well, you know, there it is. It's you know, create a system, a component, or a process that meets a great uh, a given need. What's interesting about that is that I suspect in your brain right now, you see yourself producing a thing. Maybe it's got wires, maybe it's got chips. It's, got, it's, it's, it's a thing. You can actually reach out and touch it. Take a look at that, though. You'll see that two of those things have nothing to do with a thing. Uh, systems, 
potentially, are much larger than that. And a process, there's nothing for you to touch, right? It's just potentially a better way of doing something. And that's the key thing you need to understand. So a design can take on many different shapes. Now, there's three different types of designs that you're going to see. Uh, the first one is creative designs. Creative designs are basically, you know, those are the ones that represent new or innovative products. Question to you, can you think of something that was created using a creative design? iPod. iPod, that's the easy one. What else? We, we always say iPod, right? And also iPhone and iPad, so we'll just lump them all together. What else? What else required a creative design? I guess it's creating something that never existed before, right? A microwave hybrid car. Microwave is actually sort of interesting. You know, microwave originally came from what? It was an accident. It was. What were they trying to do? Uh, I don't remember, but he melted like a butter pan in his pocket. Purchase. It, I believe it was, I think a microwave came from a Navy communication system, mm -hmm. right? You know, they were trying to communicate. Oops, what? Well, turned out it does an excellent job of cooking, right? What was the, what was the other one? Uh, he said he melted a Hershey's bar, not a Butterfinger. Oh, well, that's fine. It's all good. Cool. You know, they all melt, so that's good. Was there another product? I said hybrid cars. Hybrid cars? Well, that's actually sort of interesting. You know, I'm going to, I'm not so sure. Was that actually a creative design? I mean, it's a car, right? Four wheels, four doors. I mean, how it's powered is a little bit different. But the overall concept of a car. Now, if it was a hovercraft or a flying car, I'm on board with you there, right? Hybrid is just what it is, right? In fact, if it's one of those gas electric ones, that's not that big of a deal. It's just running on the battery, right? So, which comes down to this variant design is another approach here, right? So, it's really a variation on an existing uh, design. I would argue that hybrid cars are here. Interesting point, though, how about all electric? Maybe that's more of a, a creative design. Well, you said it, it still is a car, though. It is. It is a car. And I, you know, maybe you can draw that you know, thing to know. So interesting, a creative design in my mind. Uh, although all the iPhone stuff is pretty impressive. You know, the one that really does it here is a Palm Pilot. Does anybody remember the Palm Pilot? Right. Yes. Dating myself on this one. Palm Pilot was breakthrough. Right. It was something like that had never existed. People went crazy over that. Little Silas, little what it was a graffiti. Was it, I think graffiti was that you could scribble on it and figure out what you were actually doing and stuff like that. That was a breakthrough because it actually fit in your hand. And we, you know, laptops were the smallest thing we had at that point in time. So really, Palm did a fantastic job of opening up that market. Admittedly, Apple came along, took it over, ran with it. There's no question about that. But really, Palm was the first one to come up with a very creative design there. On variant designs, how many versions of the, uh, for example, the, uh, the Nano? The iPad Nano has there been, right? And the form factor on that has changed a whole bunch of different times. Really, what are you trying to do when you do a variant design? Are you trying to create something brand new? No, you're really trying to take something that exists and make it better, right? A huge um, area of variant designs is uh, aircraft engines. You know, so if you go on an airplane, you look out the window, you count the number of engines, you make sure there's like either two or four, and you're basically pretty happy, right? And that's a huge business. And the reason it's a huge business is because each one of those engines costs millions of dollars. Okay? It's a, uh, there's really two companies that make it. I think it's General Electric and Rolls-Royce are, are the two that make it for uh, both Airbus and for Boeing. And they're in just a fierce struggle because you don't have to sell that many other aircraft engines to have a really good year for your business. Right? And if you can make one that's quieter, because people seem to get very upset when a noisy airplane lands over their house at 10 o'clock at night, and if you can make it more fuel efficient, which is huge today, you've got a, you know, you've got a winning design, and everybody will buy your engines. So with the new Boeing aircraft, which is the 787, I think it's the Dreamliner that's coming out, and then there's a new Airbus one that's coming out. There was a huge battle as to which engines they'd use. And there's, I mean, literally armies of engineers who designed the next engine to be quieter, to use less fuel, um, and that's huge. But it's a variant design, right? Aircraft engines already existed. It's not breakthrough. If it used gas plasma technology or something cool like that, well, that'd be breakthrough. All right, and then there's routine design. Routine designs are really just, you know, there's no question about the theory. There's no question about the practice. So here's an example. When you get a cell phone, you get that little box, right? And you open up the box, and you get all those things wrapped in plastic. Every single cell phone comes with what? Charger. A charger. All right, so somebody had to design that charger, right? You think there's a lot of crazy variation going on there? The answer is no. 
right? There was an engineer who sat down at some point in time and designed a charger that would work with whatever that cell phone is. I do have some exciting news for you, though. I think they've recently reached an agreement among all the cell phone manufacturers that they're going to a universal charger. So yes. one charger that will work for all cell phones. You don't have to worry about that big box of wires you have at home right now and go, I have no idea what that fits anymore, all right? So once again, and, and our, arguably, routine designs are what the majority of technical professionals spend their time working on, right? New chargers and what have you and stuff like that. It's really just incremental small things that work with stuff. There's no question about the theory. There's no question about the practice. They will have some requirements. Let's say it has to fit to this space or use this power or cost this much, what have you. But it's pretty much crank the handle and poof, the design pops out. Things get a little bit more interesting when you get to do a variant design and things get crazy when you do a creative design because this can fall flat on its face very easily. All right, any questions? Three buckets, three types of designs? All right, that's not good. Do you remember our friend, our bike riding friend who also had the uh, coffee mug that he tried to do? So remember, we started with this particular project and we said, look, let's, let's take it from the top, let's sort of see what the story is. The reason I bring them up again is because we want to have a quick talk about project feasibility and selection criteria. Now we're going to talk about, about you know, what the concept here is before you start a project, there's a bunch of questions you need to ask. Inherently, genetically, this is not the way you're programmed. You get a project designed to you, what do you do? You sit down, you start cranking it out, right? That's just basically the way you program. So what I'm trying to say here is stop. There's a bunch of questions you have to ask yourself. You all have told me there's a type of project that you're interested in working on, right? All right. Well, that's very interesting. So here's the interesting thing. You might be running, trying to run through your mind as to how these questions line up with the project that you've selected. So let's see what the first one is. So what are you trying to do? Seems like something you want to get worked out right off the bat. This isn't always the case. Okay, there's lots of people who crank out designs without having a clear understanding. Now, in theory, you turned into me a sheet that told me what you were trying to do. Some did better than others. Okay? So the question is, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, how is it done today? And what are the limitations of the current practice? The project that you're working on, with a little up, nobody's doing today. It doesn't have to be radical. But it just has to be not done. It's a problem that exists. Okay? But the key thing here is, is to understand it's probably being done, but there are probably limitations. There's probably, however people are solving the problem that you're tackling, it's not a perfect solution that they're working on. Okay? It's a solution that works for them. They've cobbled it together, but you could do something. You could make a solution that would actually be better for them. Okay? What's new in your approach, and why do you think that it'll be successful? Just because you make a new solution to a problem that somebody has doesn't mean they're going to use it. Right? You can come up with a solution that is actually worse for them. Bigger, heavier, bulkier, too expensive, all sorts of interesting things like that. Okay? But it's entirely possible you could create a worse solution. Tragically, if you're selling a product, they're going to let you know very quickly, right? They're, they're not going to buy it. Okay? This one hurts the most. Who cares? So on the project that you're responsible for, okay, if you do it, if you do a great job, if you show up, with your red widget and say, look, this is something that I made. How will the world be changed? Will there be anybody who cares? Is anybody going to benefit from the hours and hours of effort that you put into that? If the answer is no, build an RF receiver. <laughs> then why bother? I mean, there's got to be better things for you to spend your time on. You have to, if somebody has to care, I mean, you care because you weren't great, okay? But that's just one. We should be able to get up to at least two of them. Uh, what are the risks and what are the payoffs? Risks, so what kind of risk can come along with the design project? Failure. Failure, flat out failure. What else? Loss of time. Loss of which time. Is loss of money. Loss of money. Indictment. <laughs> Indictment, <laughs> which gets back to the ethics issue. Thank you, right on board on that one, right? Scope. You. Go, oh yes, the cost can go crazy on you, right? Congratulations, you got it done, but you drove the, the company into bankruptcy, right? Your reputation is on the line too, right? Oh, you're the one who worked on the Edsel or whatever, right? <coughs> All right? How much will it cost? How long will it take? Those are huge issues. What are the midterm and final exam checks for success? Yeah, this is huge. As you're working through a project, 
Are you just going to assume that if you get to the end and it works, then it was a success? Woohoo! What do you think is a better idea? Do you think you should maybe have some waypoints, some, some checkpoints as you go along to check your success? That seems like a reasonable thing. So if it's a week before the end of the semester and you're halfway done, how are you doing? Yes, you're going to have a fantastic week. Not so well, right? So there you need to build into your plan some checkpoints that tell you whether or not you're on track or off track, because you really don't want to get surprised. All right. Characteristics the project must have, let's say must be tied to the mission and vision of the organization. What organization are you part of? Organization of one. <laughs> no. You're right, you're part of the Dell and part of the university too, right? See, I mean, you might see yourself as, a, as an island, but you're not really, okay? You're really part of at least two, probably three or four other ones, right? Okay? Whatever you work on has to have a payback. It has to have a payback for you, right? So if you're working on a project just to get the project done, where's the payback in that? Right. I went to Walmart, I got an electronics kit, and I built this. Well, congratulations, that's fantastic. But, you know, what do you get out of it? Nothing. You better be learning something, you better be solving some problem, you better at the end have somebody come to you and say, hey, thank you for doing that. You solved a problem that's been plaguing me for years. Okay? Should have a selection criteria, you need to be able to pick from, a mul from multiple projects. Ultimately, that's where you are right now, right? There's nobody telling you what you need to work on. Ultimately, it's your decision. So you have the wide world in front of you. <laughs> Which really sort of sucks if you think about it. <laughs> it's much easier if somebody shows up and says, work on this. Okay? That's not the case in this particular situation. You need to make the decision, and you need to make the decision that's right for you. You'll be able to do it. You just have to take the time to make it happen. And the objectives of the project should be SMART, which is that classic acronym for specific, measurable, reliable, realistic, time related. Fundamentally, you've got to have some goals for your project, and you have to be able to get them done within the time that's available. Right? I want to build a robot that can dance really, really well and dance under the stars. Fantastic. Great goal. Not a problem. Going to get it done this semester? No way. Okay. But once again, you just have to scope into the time and uh, that you have. All right. Needs identification. This is actually fairly important. So we had talked about the 10 steps that go into the sort of the formal engineering process. And I looked what was it, a class or two classes ago? I asked you if you remembered the story, and you said yes, and we went through it, and that was congratulations. I forgot to do the second part, and I apologize. The question is, what are the 10 steps that go in the engineering process? What's the first step in the process? I problem ID. Problem ID, excellent. What's the second step? Research. 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 What's the third step? That's the judge banging on you. That's right, you got it. Now you're 100%, okay? And that means requirements. Excellent. What comes after the judge banging on your knees? What was that? Concept generation. Concept generation. Those little uh, tennis ball cannons shooting a uh, letter or what? C, fantastic. Okay. What comes after concept generation? Lady Gaga design. Lady Gaga design. Lady dress. What comes after design? Prototype. Prototype. Excellent. After prototype? System integration. System integration, up and down the spine. What comes after that? Testing. 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 After testing? Delivery and acceptance. Production and delivery, exactly, correct. And what comes after that? Maintenance. Maintenance. Oh, you got it. I'm so proud of you. By the way, I get to make up the midterm. What do you think might be on the midterm? Is that almost a gimme at this point in time? It really sort of is. Really uh, are we naming it? The names, or are we naming it like You know, I was thinking about that today. That's an excellent question. What I was actually thinking about was give me the 10 steps to the formal engineering design process, and I'll give you half credit if you can't remember the step, but you can remember the part from the story. That's not like fair I'll go either way on that one. Extra credit if we can do both. You know, and actually, I was thinking about that. I might do that. I wish we got time to get the rest of the test done, but. All right, so, so we're here at the needs identification, right? Identification part. All right, so you need to determine the needs or requirements for the solution of the problem, which sounds so stupid. <laughs> of course. Of course I'll know what the needs are, because they'll, well, what will they do? They'll hand it to you? How does this work in the real world? I'll tell you about all the things they go to. They, they come and tell you. Well, they, they, they say, I need this done, but they'll tell you how to do it, or what exactly needs to be done before it. Right? Figure that out on your own. Fantastic. And how do they tell you that? 
by saying, hey, I think something does this. Do it. And then that's it. A requirement? Oh, that is a fantasy land you live in. I don't know that is fantastic if it shows up. And, and even if it exists, that they've written it well. Right? So yeah, you know, this, uh, you, you get your project or your design assignments in a variety of different ways. It could be a phone call, okay? Or you could be, more likely not, sitting in a meeting. And somebody says, oh wow, that is a problem. Hey, work on it, would you? And that's sort of it, right? So ultimately, it comes down to you to actually figure out what the real problem is. Everybody else is going to assume, yeah, you know what the problem is, right? We all know what the problem is. But the reality of the situation is a little bit deeper than that. Everyone thinks they know what the problem is, doesn't necessarily mean that they know. Okay, so if you have to figure out the needs, that means you have to determine the voice of the customer. You've got to figure out who the customer is. You've got to figure out what the customer's real problem is. And the problem with this is customers lie, okay? They might have a problem, but they might be too embarrassed, they might not be smart enough, they might not be able to tell you. So you are responsible for reaching into their soul, grabbing with both hands, and pulling whatever their real problem is out. <laughs> Which is very painful for them, but you know, you're there to help them, so that's all good. There's a four-step process for doing this, so let's talk about those four steps. First step, oh, screw that, let's go ahead and do a design problem. Let's go ahead and give this a try. All right, so here we go. Do you recognize this? Yeah. Yes? Have you ever driven along this road in the morning? Yeah. It's pretty ugly. Okay? Alright, so here's the problem. The traffic entering campus is too congested. I'd like you to design a new traffic lane for the westbound traffic entering at the southern entrance to the college. If I did this right, these folks coming along here going in like that. Okay? So what do they tell you to do? Design a new lane. A new lane. Well, then let's get to it. Boop. Look at that. Got a new lane. Look at that. Did you do what they told you to do? Yes. Have you completed your design project? Yes. Should they be happy? No. Fantastic. Or will they? No. You did a good job. You are a technical professional. You heard what the customer told you. You designed it. You implemented it. They can only be happy, right? Problem with this one is, come back in about a month, and it turns out traffic is still backed up. Yeah. Great. But your little lanes there, you did what they told you to do, right? So who's wrong? Customer. Come on, let's see a pointing finger. Everyone point a finger. So what are you going to do, practice later in life? Do it now! That's right! Get that blame off you, because you did what they told you. Okay, well, maybe we'll So what was the problem here? We need research. Well, it turns out it's really timing in the light, right? If you change the timing in the light, what would happen is the traffic wouldn't back up. If the traffic didn't back up, you didn't even need the extra lane. People would have enough time to make that turn. So you solved the wrong problem, which actually brings up a great story. I'm just, oh, itching for an opportunity to tell uh, My wife had a friend, Mike, um, and Mike uh, had a problem. Okay, His tooth was killing him. And it wasn't just like he got a sore tooth. It was a, I can't think straight because my tooth is just killing me. So he'd go into the dentist, and dentists would do what dentists do. They'd poke around, take a look, and they'd say, there's nothing wrong with your tooth. And so he'd leave, okay? Come back like a week later, go, man, my tooth is still killing me. There's got to be something wrong with the tooth. And they take a look at it, you know, let's see if it's rotting or no, the tooth is fine, get out of here. So he came back again a third time. He said, Listen, I I can't think straight. My tooth hurts so much. Take it out. I want a root canal. And they said, There's nothing wrong with the tooth. He said, I will pay you for a root canal. And the dentist said, well, <laughs> now we're talking. Right? And they said, you understand there's nothing wrong with the tooth? He said, I understand that you're saying there's nothing wrong with the tooth. I'm experiencing the pain. There's something wrong with the tooth. Take it out. He said, fine. So they did a root canal. Took it out. You know how root canal, well, I don't know. But anyway, so the, he's all swollen up, and they're giving him painkillers and all this. So if the time goes on, the swelling goes down, runs out of painkillers, the pain's back. Tooth's gone. The pain's back. So he goes to his regular doctor, and his doctor goes, oh, you got a sinus infection. So whatever the sinus is, the inflame is pressing on the nerve, and that's what's causing your mouth to hurt. <laughs> so he's got a hole in his mouth that his tongue can find every so often. You go, oh, oh, wait a minute. Well, either A, listen to your dentist, which is an important life lesson, or B, get the requirements before you solve the problem, right? All right, so let's see what we got here. Step one in this whole needs thing is to gather raw data from the users. 
And you're like, what? Gather data? No, it's on the piece of paper they hand to me. No, it's not on the piece of paper because nobody's handing you the paper. Or if they do hand you the paper, the paper is filled with lies. Lies and half-truths. And you need to figure out what the truth is. You can't handle the truth. What movie is that from? Toy a Good Man. <laughs> yes, the director's cut, I believe. All right, Adam, all right. So, great, you got to ask questions. What kind of questions do you have to ask? Okay, uh, clarifying questions. You want to ask questions that they cannot answer with yes or no. That's the secret to this. Would you like to have an extra lane put in coming into campus? Yes. Wrong question to ask. What's the problem? I've got traffic backing up. Okay. How would you like to have that solved? I'd like to not have traffic back up. You have to analyze what they tell you and you have to pick apart the request. The trick with this particular one here was that they gave you not only a problem, but they also gave you a solution, right? They told you what to do. Who are they? You're the designer. They shouldn't be telling you how to solve the problem. They can tell you what the problem is, but they can't tell you how to solve it, right? All right, pick apart the request. Focus on the problem, not the solution. What's interesting is in the uh, projects that were turned into me, there's a couple of projects that had a surprising amount of detail, like chips associated with them. Somebody had really thought through their design a great deal or found it on the internet someplace. So really the focus of this was to identify the problem, not the solution, right? And at this stage, you really want to focus on the problem. If you start thinking about the solution, what happens is you start to eliminate possible solutions. Wait, yeah, something along those lines. Possible ways to solve the solution start getting thrown away too early. Here's how you do it. Gather raw data, interpret the raw data, organize needs into a hierarchy. Ooh, we should talk more about that. And determine the relative importance of the needs. Remember, not all needs are created equal. I would like to have a million dollars. I'd like to have a big house. I would like to live in Jamaica. Great, which one's most important? Uh, <laughs> they're not all equal, right? They have to balance out the money. You've got to pick and choose. All right, so let's play this one. This is called an objective tree. We can call it a bunch of different things, but we're going to call it an objective tree for this class. This is actually fairly important for you to understand what it is and how it is, because you're going to be making one. All right, a portable audio device. I said that because iPod is a trademark term. There you go. Anyway, so if you're going to make a portable audio device, what are three characteristics of a portable audio device that you'd like to have? What does the thing need to have? Memory. Memory? Why? Simple. Are you solving my problem? Yes. <laughs> no. Just tell me what are my needs. I don't need to have memory. It needs to play music. It needs to play music. Okay, that's step one. What else? Portable. It has to be portable. It's called portable. What else? <laughs> <Your device. laughs> there were other devices back in the day. So you can take your music with you, Small. but they weren't used to be, yeah. What else? Small. Small. Well, that's portable. Okay, what else? It needs to be able to use it about energy efficiently. <laughs> I don't care about that. That's not a requirement. That's interesting, but that, I mean, that's a solution, right? Does that go with, why does it have to use energy efficiently so I can move it around? Hey, that's, that's portable. It'll be compatible with iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's see what we got here. Uh, high quality ice. Portable. What do you think? What else we got? What else? What else? Some cool looking. Cool looking. <laughs> Easy to use. Anybody can design one that's really hard to use. And in fact, there's been a bunch of them out there that have faded away, right? Arguably, one of the great successes of the iPod has been the fact that its user interface is actually pretty intuitive, right? Everyone's gotten sort of used to that and stuff like that. All right, let's talk about high quality audio. High quality audio, okay, that's cool. So what do we mean when we talk about high quality? What are the characteristics of high quality audio? Clear. Clear. All right, what else? Low. Low distortion. Ooh, that sounds pretty good. What else? I want to listen to my tunes. I don't know. Pretty much. Loud. Bass Loud. Bass. Low noise. You don't want to have a lot of interference, right? <laughs> you never listen to AM or FM radio? Ah, it sucks when it starts to fade out, right? All right, all right. Portable. What are the characteristics of portable that I'm going to insist before I buy this one? Small. It has to be small. It's got a lot of things. Okay, and what else? Position. Lightweight. Long last. Lightweight. I think that. <laughs> all right, what else? Yeah, that's a lot. The battery has less long time. Oh, it's not very portable. Good battery. 
Durable. <laughs> yeah, durable. <laughs> yeah, durable. <laughs> yeah, durable. Yeah, yeah, what else? Let's see what's <laughs> What's that? I wouldn't have been stopped there. That's Big Pink. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, we got four boxes here. It's entirely possible. Let's see what we got. Lightweight. So we're good at that. Small. It's pretty good for the whole portable thing. Ergonomic. I guess if you've got sharp pointy things over it, you're not going to be sticking it in pocket or anything like that. Okay, that's right. Self defense. <laughs> and environmental. It yeah. sort of goes with the battery thing, right? I mean, if you're cl clicking through uh, AA batteries left and right. Plenty of batteries going wet, wet, both. Easy to use. What are the criteria for easy to use? Yeah, but a child could use it. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, there's three boxes, so it can't be that darn and self explanatory. Buttons. Limited controls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You better not have too many buttons, all right? Can you turn on? How many people in this world have flashing uh, 12 on their VCR DVD, right? You know, so it can't be that thing. All right, multiple data formats. There you go, you don't have to worry about that. And finally, finally, you happy now? <laughs> all right, dead happy. So great, I've got all these requirements here. Are these all equal? No. No, great, which one's most important? Battery life. Battery life, of course. Well, maybe, maybe there's a different one. Quality. Quality? Hey, man, I'm environmental. Environmental? Oh, sure. Well, it all depends on the All depends on the customer. All depends on the customer. Yeah. Or the group of customers, yeah. right? So here you go. We need a way to determine the needs. Doing a pairwise comparison is probably the easiest way to do this. So here's how you do it. You list all those criteria on the, uh, as far as rows. You list all the criteria as columns. Okay? What happens is, obviously, if it's high quality, high quality doesn't count. But you take a look and you say, is the row more important than the column? Okay? Put a zero if it's less. So high quality audio is less important than portable. All right, that makes sense with me. High quality audio is sort of a tie when it comes to easy use. And what else we got here? We got portability is more important than high quality audio. We'll click that sort of analysis out there. Figure it all out. Sum up your rows, and what happens is you start you get a, the customer effectively to tell you where they were. How did you get three? How did I get three? One. Two, one. Two, one. Wait, one, two. Oh. I don't know how I got there. How about three? One, two, it's new math. Thank you very much. You get the gist of it. I'll have to go back and take a look at that. Maybe you're ranking. You know, I like that. I bet it was ranking. How's that? Of course, why I circled three, I'm not quite sure. Right up with you. Is this one half of one of both of the company, or is this you doing it yourself? Because it seems like you're charting a thing. You would, you would act, it is, it's very dynamic, right? Is portability more important than battery life? You've got to ask the person who's going to receive the product, right? It's not your thinking, it's their thinking. The battery portability is kind of the best. So you get from the company. But there could also be size and weight. True, but if it's plugged into a wall, you can't take it unless you're a little on the wire. So you would ask the customer. Step four in the process is to review the outcomes and the process that you use to get there. Review what you've collected. End results should be reviewed to determine if it makes sense. I can't tell you how important this is. As technical professionals, you're probably excellent at collecting data and putting pretty tables and making it all look good. But you really need to take a step back and say, great, fantastic data collection. Does this make any sense whatsoever? Because more often than not, you'll go, whoa. Either A, we asked the wrong question, or the customer went crazy, or they answered the question, but clearly they're thinking about something else besides what we're planning to write. The objectives challenge uh, assumptions fully identify the problem, or with that. Three outcomes of the needs identification process requirements, yay! An objective tree, yay! And a ranking of the relative importance of the needs, and you actually have to do your math correctly. Huh. <laughs> all right, research strategy. All right, so look, after you've collected all, what do we do? What's the second step in the process? Research! Google tattoo, remember? Okay. So what do you have to do? What's the basic theory behind the concept? How's it currently being done? This one's huge. What's well, the state of the art? Yeah, but, but here's the thing. Most of the things that you'd be designing a solution for, there's already a solution out there. Okay? I mean, you know, maybe it's brand new, but it probably isn't, right? It's your responsibility to take a look at how it's being done. For the projects that you'll be doing for your capstone, there's probably already a solution there. Hopefully your solution is going to be better. Okay? But it's your responsibility to take a look and see how it's currently being done. 
you really don't want to reinvent the wheel. Wheel, okay? Uh, limitations of current designs and methodologies, similarities and difference between your concept and existing technologies. Hey, great. You made another iPhone. Great, that's all we really need. Okay, are there existing or patented technologies that may be relevant to the design? Okay, who owns them, can you use them, all that sort of stuff like that. So, research is important. Take the time to do it. And you won't find yourself in the awkward situation where you've designed something that already exists. Boom! Yes? Since you kind of covered it, how do you uh, research patents? How do you research patents? Well, actually, you do it online. Yay! Uh, U.S. Patent Office. U.S. PTO? Yeah, probably more. They actually are pretty good these days. So you can do there, you can go there and you can do a search. You can also see the stats. Because remember, and it's all getting ready to change, but right now you can do, um, once you apply for a patent, you're the, you are the patent holder, effectively, even if your patent hasn't approved. So if you and I both invent a red widget, okay, if I can prove that I came up with the idea first, I'm considered the patent holder, even if you apply first. So this is huge, right? If I thought of it first, and I can show that I have a lab notebook that proves that I thought of it first, I win. It's my patent. What if you already get that patent? Now here's the gist of it. That's all going to change when Congress passes a law probably sometimes this month. It's going to go to first to file. You and I both think of an idea. I thought of it first. You got to the patent office and submitted your application and paid your $200 first. You win. It's your patent. I lose. Okay? Once again, that's the way it is in the rest of the world. U.S. is the only place where it's first to invent as opposed to first to file. It's goofy, right? It's just strange stuff. But yeah, so, but you can research it very easily on a, um, you go to the patent office, you can type in search strings and all that sort of stuff like that. And by the way, there's legal guys who do nothing but search patents for a patent and infringement design. Question, question, question? All right. Uh, project application, problem statement. This is huge. This is an important thing. So after you've done all this problem identification, after you've done the research, you need to create what's called a problem statement, which is just a very succinct statement of exactly what the heck problem you're planning on solving. Okay? Uh, clear problem statement should be developed after the needs are identified. Problem statement should identify the needs and objectives of the product. What are you doing and why are you doing it? Need statement should briefly state the need being addressed. Okay? Objective statement summarizes what's being proposed and a detailed description of the implementation should be avoided. So don't be designing at this point in time. Describe the problem first. What goes into a problem statement? Oh, here. I put the slides online. So these are the things you need, objective background marketing, objective training, and ranking of the needs. Those are pretty straightforward. Here was a fantastic driver's awareness system that we were going to go over and we're going to do a needs identification for, but we don't have time. But for those of you who are proposing something like this for your uh, uh, project, just be under, just let's be aware, it's been done before. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Doesn't mean you can't add some value there and stuff like that. But such solutions are out there. Radar turn around your car. You're going to hit that car. All right. Here we go, guys. Team assignment. Oh, this is why I get up in the morning. California represents in Florida. Which is interesting that you should say that, because I need representatives of the following teams to come up. California, New York, <laughs> Illinois, Ohio, Georgia, and New Jersey. I need you over there. Oh. That's God. <laughs> she just smiled. Oh, you want it? All right, well, we get the five. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign you your team project. So this is a team project that you're going to work on in multiple steps. There's going to be exciting in-class presentations associated with it. So you're going to get one of four different projects. Uh, you're going to get to do your first in-class presentation during the week of September 20th. One on, you know, six of you will do it on Tuesday and five, uh, six of you will do it on uh, Thursday. Presentations must be made by a team member who has not yet presented. So if you're presented, you're not going to be presenting again. I'm going to get everybody up here. Um, pres oh, I love this part of it. Presentations will be on the problem identification and research phases of your design. See this? Do I have everybody's attention? This might be important. <clears throat> Whatever. The class will determine part of your grade. What? 
Anybody watch Survivor? <laughs> yeah, give me a fan of great guys. So here's the way this is going to work. Team A is going to present on their project, and Team B is going to present on the same project. And then when they're both sitting down, I'm going to ask you, who did the better job? And the people who did a better job get all the points. People who didn't do as good of a job get half the points. You get to determine that portion of the grade. I get to determine the other part. But there is a class input. Yeah, how much, how much does that affect the grade? Over 10,000 points. <laughs> <laughs> or actually, 1 million. No. Over a trillion points. Yes. So, all right. So, it's a fairly big deal for you, right? So, I need uh, Team California. Who's coming out for Team California? Everything is not working today. I have a little scraps of paper here. Pick one. Doesn't here. matter. Pick the right one. <laughs> <laughs> better pick the right one. Okay. Oh, what did you pick? Donkey. <laughs> <laughs> you pick donkey. <laughs> Oh, oh buddy. That's a fun one. So you have the liquid hazardous, ha liquid hazardous waste. Now, who here is from uh, Team Texas? Great. You got the liquid hazardous waste. Awesome. Yeah. Mr. Samuel picked for you also. If at any point in time you were displeased with that one, Mr. Samuel is the one who picked. I would right. Who's my representative from New York? <laughs> Mr. Weissman? Weiss Somalia? Oh, you picked the right one. Mining. Mining. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Kenneth picked the uh, mining oxygen tank problem, which means Florida. Who's here from Florida? Here. Excellent. You got the mining oxygen tank problem, okay? Who's here from Illinois? Who's my representative from Team Illinois? Uh, <laughs> I'm actually talking to one of the members, so I can tell him. He's really? in traffic. An really? They're all gone? Yeah, there was an accident on the big horse. He's in Malibu. I see the hype. <laughs> 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 Who's here from uh, Pennsylvania? Team Pennsylvania. Actually, you guys got the pipeline project. <laughs> You'll have to take a look. You have to read the problem. Are these problems on They're in my head, and you'll have to. Yes, they are. Team Ohio. That is a great state. That's Mr. O'Brien, correct? Yeah. Pick and choose, sir, whichever one you want. Yes. Yeah. 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 Shit. You got the nuclear waste project. Awesome. Oh, nuclear waste. That's Team Georgia. Georgia. Come on, Scott. <laughs> Mr. Muir? Yes. Pick one, sir. Oh, wait, two left. I'm alive. Nope. Two best ones, though. Oh, why did you pick that one? Uh, nuclear yeah. waste. Storage tank. So we, who just got that one? We do it together. All right. North Carolina. Who's here from North Carolina? <laughs> there you go. All right, you're the man. You guys got nuclear uh, waste storage. All right, New Jersey. Is there a rule against trading with other teams? Yes, there is. <laughs> is that in the rules too? Yes. You can pick whichever one you want as long as it's that one. All right. Got uh, New Jersey got oxygen tanks. Virginia. Who's here from Virginia? Actually, you guys got oxygen tanks. Uh, um, all of these are online on the Blackboard system. I put them up last night. I think they're in assignments, I believe. So let's take a look and see what we have to do. All right, in class presentation, the formal problem statement for your problem. This is half of it. We still got to go over requirements. I'm going to be asking you to present the requirements for it also in the same session. There's nothing to turn in because I don't want to grade it. It's all based on your presentation. A little hint from somebody who knows. You might want to practice your presentation. You can go in the class and wing it. 
But remember, the class is voting, right? So you're actually in competition with that other team. So are we making a PowerPoint or are you just speaking? You can make a PowerPoint if you want. I prefer to. Then that's fine. I will make a, a, a projector and PowerPoint available to you. Does that sound like a fair deal? Yeah. I'll even make a screen. I'll even make a screen for it too, okay? What you make? You want the, the question about the screen? No, really? uh, uh, no, 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 no. I was just trying to see. I forgot what team you were in. Oh, that's right. You forgot what assignment New York had? No, 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 no. Who were like up your Up your get? Up your get? All right, so on Tuesday, teams California, Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois, and Pennsylvania will present. So California and Texas are together? Yes, that actually is correct. California, Texas, New York, Florida, so Illinois, and Pennsylvania. 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 Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, North Carolina, New Jersey, and Virginia will then present on Thursday. Sorry, what's that? All right. Are there any questions at this point in time? Hopefully not. What an exciting adventure that you are embarking on. What is the duration of like these presentations to be? They really can't be very long. I think you guys, let's see, so there's, we've got about 60 minutes. And we've got six teams, so you've got no more than ten minutes. So five minutes. And oh, by the way, folks can ask questions, right? So, oh my goodness, I have to get moving on this. Okay. Anyway, uh, so let's talk about your capstone here, shall we? So, what are the steps in your capstone? We've had an enjoyable, hey, pick a topic. Fantastic. Get that one here. Woo! -hoo! So, what do you do next? I don't know. Uh, determine an objective for your capstone, right? Why are you doing it? There's got to be a reason. Whose life is going to be made better because of the time that you spent on it? Write a description of your project, create an objective tree, pick a faculty member, estimate the effort for each one. Oh, by the way, report the poster, sequence your objectives. Are you going to be able to do them one after another? Can you do any of them in parallel? Determine how much time you have, determine where you spend your time, scope the project. Oh, by the way, can it be done? Okay, I'm not giving you an assignment yet. But I want you to be thinking about what the next steps are. Because you've got to make it all fit in the semester, guys. All right. Um, by the way, so I checked with uh, Dr. Wiley. I said, hey, what kind of support do we give to the students for doing their capstone? So this is what he told me. He said, good news, you get to use the circuits lab and the microprocessors lab. So they, the university will make those two labs available for you, I assume with all the tools and equipment that are in those labs. I don't think you get any parts, but you get the equipment. Uh, the department does not pay for any parts or tools. So, these are characteristics, these are criteria that go into your design. If you're planning on making a gold-plated robot, fantastic, I think that's a great idea. You're going to have to figure out how you're going to be paying for that gold plate. All right? So, shall we talk about ethics? Now the last one, what was the last one? It was the lady who had the drinking problem who asked me to be a reference. We were a little bit back and forth. We didn't have unity in the class as to exactly what we should do. Hopefully today you guys can get your act together and come up with one single solution, okay? I mean, you're engineers. The world's black and white, right? How hard could this possibly be? All right, let's give it a shot. Here you go. So you're running an online auction company. Fantastic. It's going gangbusters. Everything's going well. Mom's very proud of you, okay? You want to get some t-shirts. You can get t-shirts from a low-cost company in China, or you can get them from one of those tree-hugging fair trade companies in San Francisco. San Francisco company has beautiful, safe air conditioning and higher wages for their, for their workers. Uh, fair trade shirts cost about $28.65 per shirt. Total project is going to be about $8,500 for all those t-shirts you want to buy and sell in your, on your website. However, the Chinese t-shirts are only $5.50 a pop. Man, that's a lot less. And your grand total is like $1,100. That's, a, by the way, $1,100 is a lot less than $8,500. Okay. T-shirts from China would be cheaper. And because they're cheaper, then you can make a more elaborate design with more graphics and more color. You'd probably sell more of them, right? Working conditions in China, not so good. Low wages, rigorous work schedule, poor safety requirements. And you know all this. You know, it's sort of sweat shoppy, okay? San Francisco t-shirts, okay, they're more expensive, but they're fair trade, 
They're organic t-shirts, whatever the heck that actually means. <laughs> and they're eco-friendly. It means going to heaven. And, oh, I think so. This is beautiful. <laughs> So what should you do? Where should you get your shirts from? China. 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 Yes. I mean, what's sadder than a bunch of sweatshop workers who don't have anything to do, right? That's their job. You're actually giving them a work. Yeah. Who knows? I'm close. Not quite. Don't worry about it. So I'm sorry. So you're saying China? Why? Why China? They would rather be working in a sweatshop making money than seeing a home not doing anything. So I mean, they're making. So you're really helping out the sweatshop workers. So you're giving a business. We're giving a business. Who would spend thirty bucks on a T-shirt? Right. Hey, hey, a lot of people. Actually, it's a little bit better than that. The guy at the dot com store was buying T-shirts for like eighty bucks at Hardy. Right. It was like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> are you paying? Are you paying? <laughs> so, so, I mean, are we, is there anybody who disagrees with the whole buyer from China? Anybody going to buy from the center says, oh, we've got one in the back, okay, which is fantastic. I have a question, though. How would oh. you know? Would you really know if there, were, there was a sweatshop condition in China? The answer is no. And that's a good question. You don't. You know, you'd be making an assumption. Now, you know, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard about a really good working conditions in China? No. Well, for no, that it doesn't, doesn't mean, mean it doesn't mean that they're. It doesn't mean no. Definitely does not. But have you ever heard? Anybody ever gone? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> be have, you, have you seen the cafeteria at our Chinese garment factory? We've got like a latte machine here, and they do sushi. I don't know. No, not sushi. No. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the question in the back. All right, but even if you buy it from the California shop, how do you know they're not buying it from China and then yeah. charging you? They could be lying. Yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps, dare we say it, they're not organic. <laughs> I mean, how are you going to tell, right? Yeah. You're right. <laughs> so you're right. They could be <laughs> lying. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not paying a special to California Cumber to tell them how cheap you can get them from China and say we want to buy domestically. You sure could. So you could go back to that San Francisco company and say, you guys are crazy overpriced, right? I mean, I can get it for, you know, almost nothing from China. But, you know, I want to do the right green environmentally good working condition thing. If you lower your price, then maybe I'll buy from you. Do you think they can get anywhere near $1,100? No, no, no. It's like, I mean, even if they slash it in half, they're still four times as much, right? Right. So, I mean, you can go talk to them, but you know what they're going to tell you? They're going to say, listen, yes, it's more expensive, but you're getting a product that you're going to be able to sell to a group of customers who are going to say, listen, I do care about working conditions. I do, I want to support the right things. I'm willing to pay them more money because it's got all these Fair trade, organic, and equal kind of stuff. You guys get uh, coffee at Starbucks? You make a coffee at Starbucks? We'll do that, yeah. And they support what? Like free trade agreements where they pay enough for the coffee beans from the folks from whatever company, right? So you're supporting it. You know, Dunkin' Donuts, I don't think, has any free trade agreements. Yeah, Starbucks to support them. Where Starbucks to drink coffee? Right. But you could go to Dunkin' Donuts, right? Yeah, but it's convenient because it's one of the libraries. Okay, so convenient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn the coffee growers! <laughs> 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 so you guys are willing to, to pay less for your shirts. Now let me just make sure, are we all in agreement on this? No. Mr. O'Brien, you're shaking your head, buddy. Look, we're all on board, buddy. Come on. You're, you're going to go with the San Francisco company? No, we're going to from California. Everything's twice the expense over there. Business taxes are... That's crazy. And maybe that's going into the... If you go outside of California, the price is going to drop to 20, maybe lower. Yeah, but you're not going to be able to get your fair trade, organic, and eco friendly. Sure you can't, sure. you yeah, can't be both of them. No. I'm only giving you two options. For whatever reason, because of the inflammatory messages that you want to print on your t shirts, there's only two companies in the world that will actually print them for you. One's or in. a higher company just outside of California. Drive. Not an option. It's not an option. Because of your rush print job, because you did poor project planning, you need to have those shirts post haste. There's only two companies that can do it for you. You gotta pick between these two. There's not a third option. China. China? China. China. Are we in unity on this? Yes, sir. Anyways, everything is bought in China nowadays. Yeah. All the furniture comes from China. Everything so it's okay. China. It's okay to continue the culture of sweatshops because everything comes from China anyway. 
Over the last 30 years, we've increased China's wealth by These are fascinating justifications. Are these going to make you feel better? Yes. Well, here's, here's the bottom line. We didn't make the rules. We are just business people, and we're trying to make money. That's somebody else's job to figure out how to lower the wages or lower these costs. I, I think that's beautiful. I seem to call it the end of World War II. That's what all the guys that have been captured from Germany said too. Sorry. <laughs> just, I'm just do it. I'm trying to make money. Just, I mean, it's really. I'm a 13-year-old girl at heart. Really. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's just all about the money, right? If I'm in business and that's what we're speaking, that's what I'm doing. And because if you don't choose China, you're not going to stay in business, right? Well, you probably won't uh, succeed like everyone else will. So or everyone else will be out. more successful. You might still be successful, but everybody else is going to be more successful, right? Yeah, but then. And you can't have that, can you? Because you've got to be number one. Number one. Yeah. Would it be okay to be number two? Or you have to be number yeah. one. <laughs> Number two out of how many? <laughs> You've been quiet during this discussion, sir. So what are you what are you thinking here? You're gonna go with the China solution? Uh, I don't know. I like American not products. Buy American products. And by the way, can I mention fair trade, organic, and equal? Okay, we're all about that. That actually is <laughs> Well, you know it's interesting because you guys are thinking about this in terms of what you want. Are you going to be wearing all these shirts? No. Yes. Who's going to be wearing your shirts? My customers. What do you think your customers want? Cheese. You know, for, so somebody said cheap, which is fascinating. That's cool. I seem to recall that BMW sells a great number of their 7 Series. And I seem to recall there's a company called Bentley that seems to be doing okay. And those crazy kids at Ferrari, man. Right. Gucci, Gucci's doing okay, if I recall correctly. So yeah, you're right. There are Walmart shoppers among them. Most people are willing to pay more for product and better. You know that's true, right? Because if you get it from China, what's going to happen to that shirt? It's going to fall apart, right? Maybe. You can't say that for certain, but let's say is there a high probability that it's going to fall apart on you? Those beautiful, elaborate designs with more graphics and colors are going to go to the right? Yeah, but can't you buy like five? My six of them. You know, generally on these type of purchases, you can't, and the reason is because they set up and they run the run, right? So uh, you're right. Hey, could I get a sample to see how it is? Generally, the answer to that, just because I've done this sort of stuff before, is you can't. You you get it all set up. You say that's what I want, and poof, you're done. You especially if you're buying from China, what are they going to do? Ship you one shirt? You know, the time <laughs> delay and all that's going to be way too long. So you'll approve the graphics should be done, and then you sort of get what you get. Look, you're only paying $1,100 for it, okay? But how much are you making back on it? It depends on how much you sell it for, right? You're making a lot more on this because, well, it really depends on what you price your shirt at, right? Yeah. You can make equal amounts on those, but you'd have to obviously charge your customers more. But you could tell them that they are fair trade organic. And you could say, not from China. Made in USA. Made in USA, and there's clearly a, a party customer base that will appeal to. A lot of different ways to handle it. Well, very small. All right. <laughs> clearly, what you need is a framework for making these types of decisions. What are the relevant facts in the case? Do we know that it's going to be a sweatshop? No, we don't actually know that. Do we know if the San Francisco folks are just going to import it from China and go ahead and sell it to us as it was from America? No, we don't know. What facts are not known? Can I learn more about the situation? And do I know enough to make a decision? It's entirely possible you don't have enough information to make a decision. Okay? What individuals and groups have an important stake in the outcome? Are, the, are some concerns more important than others? Not everybody's crazy, right? And what are the opinion options for acting? Have all the relevant people and groups been consulted? Have I identified creative options? A creative option, Mr. O'Brien said, buy from somebody else. Buy from somebody who's not in California and see if they've got lower prices. Not an option, but it is very creative. So there you go. All right. What did we cover today? Project selection needs identification. Fantastic opportunity to do portable uh, audio device example. Talked about research strategy. Talked about problem statement. You guys are very, very happy right now because you got your multi-step team assignment. We talked about steps in your capstone project. We started building that sort of framework. What are we going to do next time? Requirements and even more ethics. Woo! That's it. Have a fantastic weekend, guys. See ya.